Etienne Dodem, uh, Chimney Singh, and Don Jabbar. My name is Hayden King. I'm um, from Bosle First Nation on Chimney Singh, just uh, two hours north of here. I actually grew up right around uh, this area, Collingwood area. Grew up for a time on uh, Mason Road, about seven, seven minutes away. Um, so it's nice to be back. Uh, nice to have my daughter with me. We went to a, a forest school in the woods here yesterday and taught some, uh, taught some students some stories and songs. Uh, but here today, I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk about Canada's emerging rights framework. Um, this is, I'll explain it in more detail, but this is a very broad sort of transformation of the federal government's approach to Indigenous uh, policy and rights in Canada. And it's, uh, this presentation will help contextualize uh, the discussion of free prior informed consent. So the atmosphere, the legal and policy atmosphere that we're moving towards is the one in which uh, First Nations are going to be expected to undertake um, practices of free prior and informed consent with or without the government, provincial or federal. So this uh, presentation is based on the work of an organization called Yellowhead Institute. I'm the executive director of Yellowhead Institute. We have a four-member executive team of Indigenous academics. Uh, we have a seven-member advisory board of First Nation um, uh, community leaders, we have 15 research fellows, First Nation research fellows from across the country. Uh, we sort of started to exist in June online. We uh, released our first report, which was the result of 30 First Nation policy experts from across the country coming together at Ryerson for a two-day workshop to sort of analyze the emerging changes that were happening from a liberal government. And we produced a report, a 30-page report, um, that this presentation is uh, uh, drawing on. So the Yellowhead Institute did begin in, in June, but it launched formally just, uh, what day is it today? Thursday? Tuesday night. It just launched Tuesday night at, at Ryerson University. So I hope you hear a lot more about Yellowhead Institute in the coming uh, weeks and months. So what is the Indigenous Rights Framework? The Indigenous, uh, it's actually called the Indigenous Rights Recognition and Implementation Framework. Uh, it's a little bit of a mouthful. Has anybody heard of it? Yeah, you've all heard of it. So you all know it's coming. Not all of you. So some of you know it's coming. So when we did the initial report and the analysis back in June, very few people knew it was coming. The government uh, was consulting, but it was consulting with uh, very small groups and not in very transparent ways. And so most communities and community members had no idea that there were these pretty dramatic changes coming to Indigenous rights uh, and uh, changes to Indigenous policy. So now fast forward a couple, of, uh, a couple of months and people are starting to be aware of it. The leadership has done a little bit better job of making people know that uh, there are changes coming. So we've been conceptualizing at Yellowhead, uh, we've been conceptualizing the rights recognition framework in two registers. That is, there's a general process happening where Canada is changing the very machinery of government. Uh, changing a variety of policies, whether it's the land claims policy or the financing regime. And then there's legislative changes as well, uh, which include a dramatic, number of, uh, a dramatic number of pieces of legislation, actually. And, the, and so there's from the general changes that are happening, and then there will be specific legislation that's introduced uh, if the government's timeline, well, it's been pushed back a couple times already, but if they stick to their new timeline, they'll be releasing it in, uh, sometime in December. So at the general level, um, I just want to provide a glimpse at what's been happening. So if we talk about the Indigenous Rights Recognition and Implementation Framework, or the Rights Framework, at the general level, we can see the process started uh, at the least in June 2016. Uh, I think Russ is presenting later, he'll pr probably provide a much broader context, but as soon as the Liberal government got into power, they began to start making changes to how uh, they were going to relate to Indigenous people. So in June 2016, they launched these recognition of in Indigenous rights and self-determination discussion tables to rethink, in their words, how they were going to approach self-government and land claims, but they also began using those as consultation bodies. So they were using these groups, uh, these negotiation tables, to help them inform uh, the legislation. At least that was what they said they were going to do. In 2017, uh, uh, February 2017, they struck a working group to review all laws and policies that may affect Indigenous people. 
And this working group would review those laws and policies to make sure that they don't infringe on Aboriginal rights, treaties, etc. The problem is, of course, and I'll talk about this in more depth, that it's a cabinet committee bound by cabinet secrecy, and it's entirely partisan, right? So it's a group of liberals uh, talking about whether or not their laws were going to violate Aboriginal rights in secret. Then in June 2016, we had the Assembly of First Nations sign a Memorandum of Understanding with Canada on joint priorities, so very high level, what are our shared interests and goals and how can we achieve them. Um, the Inuit National Organization and Métis National Organization also signed one of these MOUs, so we're seeing more and more relationship changes. Uh, in July 2017, they released their 10 principles respecting the rights of Indigenous people, or respecting their relationship with Indigenous people. So these 10 principles were sort of their terms of reference for how they were going to relate with to Indigenous people moving forward, um, guide all of their relations. August, they decided that one Ministry of Indi Indian Affairs wasn't enough, so they created two Ministries of Indian Affairs. In fact, there's now three ministries, if you include Northern, Northern Affairs, the Department of Indigenous Services, and now Crown Indigenous Relations. Uh, that hasn't been, uh, this, this change hasn't been formalized in law, but that's coming. In December, they created two fiscal relations policies, one for Indian Act bans and one for self-governing groups. Those policies have gone to cabinet, but are still in, uh, uh, in, in, the pro in, in development, in negotiation. In December, they established the National Reconciliation Council. So this is a group of people that's supposed to, supposedly supposed to hold the government account, accountable for its reconciliation commitments. So far, it seems that the group is a fairly moderate group. In other words, they've appointed people that aren't going to criticize the Liberals too much. Um, in February, they uh, created draft legislation relating to uh, lands and resource management. So this includes everything from pipelines to environmental assessment to fisheries, uh, and it impacts First Nation and First Nation rights, of course, and title. In September 2018, they released their first discussion paper. So all of this was happening, and they had yet to tell First Nations what they were going to put in the legislation, the rights and recognition of the legislation. So only in September of this year did they release a discussion paper scoping what they were going to include in the legislation and, and uh, what it might look like. And so we got our first glimpse of it just uh, a couple months ago. And then uh, fast forward to winter 2018, we, uh, December, we're supposed to have the legislation, uh, the rights recognition implementation legislation. So at Yellowhead, we did a critical analysis of this approach at the general level. So we're looking at the general changes to the relationship, and then we'll get down to the specific and look at the legislation itself. And we see changes happening across three spectrums, or um, spectrums might not be the right word, but across three levels of change. There's relationship reform, policy reform, and legislative reform. So let's just start with the relationship reform. Um, <clears throat> So in the relationship reform, I started to mention some of the uh, changes that they were going to make. The first of these changes was the uh, release of the 10 principles. Has everybody heard of the 10 principles? 10 principles respecting the relationship with indigenous people. So I think they were received initially with some support from First Nations because there was a lot of positive language, you know, nation to nation, reconciliation, jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look very closely at the 10 principles, you realize pretty quickly that they, uh, they, they, they certainly reinforce the notion of Canadian Confederation. So the 10 principles say, there's, we're not gonna change anything fundamental about Canadian Confederation. The provinces have their uh, powers via the Constitution. Federal government has their powers via the Constitution. And any discussion we have with First Nations through this 10 principles is not gonna upset that. Uh, 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 framework. And I think that's our sort of first indication that nothing fundamental about Canada or its institutions are going to change. But there's also a number of other uh, concerning elements in the Ten Principles. There is uh, an aspirational mention of free, prior, and informed consent. Uh, but of course it, is, it, it, it continues to be restricted to aspirational, which is maybe the most significant trend in Canada's uh, discursive uh, our relationship with First Nations. You know, we'll try to do this. We want to do that. We, you know, promise to do this. Um, and they emphasize the power of Canada to infringe on, on Aboriginal rights. So, of course, the courts have upheld 
uh, uh, Canada and the province's ability to infringe on Aboriginal rights and title, and so uh, the executive of Canada is also upholding that. Now the principles do say we're going to do everything we can to be polite and, and nice about it, but we will still infringe on your rights and title. So the 10 principles were uh, part of the relationship for reform. Another aspect of the relationship reform was these three MOUs that I mentioned with each of the national organizations, uh, national indigenous organizations, uh, Inuit, Métis, AFM. There's also um, something similar for the Native women and the modern treaty holders. Um, so this was, I think, welcomed by a lot of First Nation leaders at the time. In fact, the, the Métis are are infatuated with this idea, and I think that it's partly because we've had 10 years, 10 years of a previous government that, that really wasn't interested in sitting down with First Nations to talk about anything. And so now we have these three MOUs, but the challenge that we see happening is that uh, while Canada and the AFN in particular are saying no decisions are being made at these tables, at this Crown Indigenous table, we do see decisions being made on joint priorities going in particular directions. And this is being done without going to communities and saying, you know, what do you want? How can we realize your aspirations? What are, how do you conceptualize your right title? What are your goals? Instead, the, A the AFN is making those decisions, uh, not necessarily paying attention to uh, what, the, what First Nations are, are advocating for. And so that's problematic, I think. And so, for initially, I think that I think that this is less the case now. I think the AFN has recognized the criticism and, and stepped back a little bit. Um, but Canada, I think, would prefer that the nation-to-nation -nation relationship was Canada AFN. Uh, it would be convenient for them. And the AFN would be a nice one-stop consultation shop. Mm -hmm. Um, and then finally on relationship reform, there was the structural changes to the federal government's uh, uh, bureaucracy. So that meant that we took Indian Affairs and Northern Development Canada. It's really remarkable if you step back and think about how many name changes this ministry has had over the past 50 years. You know, the Department of Indian Affairs, Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs, Ministry of Indigenous Affairs, and now we have the Ministry of Crown Indigenous Relations and the Department of Indigenous Services. And since, you know, since June, since we did this work, they've taken Northern Affairs and split Northern Affairs off, and now Northern Affairs is with Dominic LeBlanc, and I can't remember what other portfolio he has, but... Uh, Inter uh, Intergovernmental. Pardon me? I think it's Intergovernmental Affairs. Intergovernmental, what is it? So now there's, that, now there's effectively three ministries that have a uh, primary, I mean, all ministries, the Ministry of Health, Education, have, have Indigenous Departments, Attorney General, but uh, we have these three Indigenous Relations uh, uh, ministries. And so uh, they cleave this off. And I think interestingly, again, the Liberals are very savvy, right? They're very savvy. They have looked at recommendations that have been made in the past. And so in 1996, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples actually said we should split, we should make two ministries. Uh, we should take the Department of Indian Affairs with its toxic culture and its paternalism and racism and get rid of it. And, it, and, and in its place, we should create these two other ministries. One for diplomatic relations with treaty holders and to negotiate treaties and to figure out what our relationship is going to be. And then the other to administer services which are owed via treaty. And so they took that idea, but now we're at the place where, we're, where nobody really knows what uh, CERNA is doing versus what ISK is doing. I don't think that bureaucrats within either of those ministries know what they're doing. I don't, they didn't know that they were being split. Uh, there was much confusion in the months that preceded about who was going into which department. Um, and now today, we don't really know because if we think about treaties as providing education, health care, housing infrastructure, well, those are services. So who's provi who, who are we talking to about that? Is it the Department of Indigenous Services or is it the Department of Crown Indigenous Relations? And so there's a lot of confusion over, over this. We don't know how this is going to impact uh, Aboriginal <coughs> rights title and treaties. Our Aboriginal rights is, is Crown Indigenous Relations responsible for Section 35 rights? Is the Department of Indigenous Services responsible for Section 91, uh, 24 rights? Um, we're not sure. Now, the Department of Indigenous Services, the Minister Philpott has said that uh, she wants to uh, work herself out of a job. So we know that the goal of the federal government is to devolve, to devolve services to First Nations. 
so that the Department of Indigenous Services no longer exists. So that was a major structural concern or uh, uh, relationship reform, but it is not without uh, uh, concerns. So uh, moving on from a relationship reform uh, onto policy reform, there are a tremendous amount of uh, policy changes that have been uh, proposed by the government in, in its three years in power. And I'll go through some of them uh, kind of briefly, pretty briefly. So <clears throat> first, the federal government, if it wants to devolve service delivery to First Nations, which has slowly been happening since the 60s and 70s, right? Indian control of Indian education, uh, breaking down residential schools, gradually uh, allowing First Nations to administer those services, administer some health care <coughs> services, administer some child welfare services, while well, the federal government wants to continue with that trend. So and it wants to quote unquote reconstitute nations to be able to do that. Now what reconstitution, reconstituting nations means to them, they have, they have said, we don't care how you reconstitute your nations. We just want you to reconstitute your nations. And what they, what they would like to see is that smaller First Nations come together and form aggregates. So they don't believe that it works out. It doesn't make economic sense for a single First Nation to deliver services to a small population. It doesn't make economic sense for them. So what they would like to see is First Nations amalgamate into regional groupings. You can do it via treaty, you can do it via tribal council, you can do it via nation, uh, you can do it via a couple First Nations getting together, pooling your resources and delivering child welfare uh, services to those communities. So they hold up all the time. Anishinaabek Nation, I don't know if they ever expected, to, uh, expected this to happen, but Carolyn Bennett, everywhere she goes, she holds up the Anishinaabek education system as a wonderful, shining example. Meanwhile, in our community, no one knows what the AES is doing or uh, how it's working. But meanwhile, it's this miracle of First Nation self-government. So, but that's what they want more of. They want more AES, they want more child welfare, aggregate. And I'm not saying aggregation is a bad idea in principle. It makes a lot of sense, actually. But that's what uh, the federal government wants to do. Reconstitute nations means aggregation um, and then service delivery. So a lot of the, the funding that's available, and if you're, in a, if you're working in your community right now, you will have gotten emails and notices from the federal government that there's nation building money available and uh, community capacity building money available. And so you can access those funds and figure out how to um, build your nation up to uh, deliver services. Second on policy reform is um, uh, fiscal capacity. So Canada wants to build fiscal, uh, Canada wants uh, First Nations to build administrative capacity, but they also want First Nations to build um, financial capacity. And so the new fiscal relationship, what the Liberals are moving towards a new fiscal relationship, I mean, everybody recognizes we need a new, need a new financing regime. We have had, 20 years of cuts to our communities. First Nations, this started in 1996 with Paul Martin, the 2% cap. 2% cap on all funding for First Nations. Meanwhile, population growth and inflation is outstripping 2% a year. So that means an annual cut for two years. That means 20 years, not even 20 years, of course, 150 years of chronic underfunding to First Nations uh, to deliver the programs and services to survive um, we've been experiencing. So everybody recognizes we have to repeal the financing regime. And to the government's credit, they have uh, broken down, or they are in the process of breaking down the third party management policy, which was, of course, this policy where First Nations that weren't financially fit, according to the federal government, uh, their, the power uh, to administer their community was taken away from them, given to an accountant. That accountant paid 200000 400000 dollars a year out of the First Nation funds. Uh, so they've taken that policy and they're breaking it down. They've taken the Transparency Act, which ironically I think a lot of First Nation community members were starting to like, um, and they've scrapped that as well. So First Nations are no longer required to uh, uh, report on chief and council salaries. But uh, they have also moved towards this uh, process to um, help First Nations become more uh, uh, accountable and financially, financially fit. So they're looking at what are called First Nation financial institutions. Has anybody heard of these First Nation financial institutions? These 
sort of vague organizations that are supposed to be First Nation led, but the process for appointing members is, is unclear. And these organizations are gonna help communities build financial capacity, and they're also going to test whether or not First Nations are suitable for the big reveal of the Liberal government's new fiscal policy, which is the 10-year grants. So everybody knows the one-year planning horizon that First Nations typically have to operate under is ridiculous. Nobody can plan anything from a year-to-year -year, uh, planning horizon. And so some communities have been able to break out of that. Many other communities haven't. Now the federal government has said, we are going to give you 10 years of funding. So you, it'll, be, it'll be, what does Perry Belgard say? Um, Stable, reliable, consistent funding. So we'll know what that. We'll know how much money we'll have over those ten years. Now, that's wonderful. If you can prove that you're financially fit, you have your accounting processes, your uh, your financial regulations in place, then you can qualify for these ten-year grants. Federal government says 250 communities are interested in these ten-year grants already. We don't know what interested means, but 250 have expressed some interest. So if you can go through the process and you qualify, you'll get the 10-year grants. Now, this is the catch. Nothing in the policy right now, nothing in any federal official statement has talked uh, one sentence or one word about redistributing wealth or resources. So federal government's not talking about dramatically increasing funding or transferring wealth to First Nations. So the result could be you go through this process and apply for 10 years of chronic underfunding. Um, of course, there is more money in the budget uh, for services, but we do not see the level of uh, funding that's, that's, that's required to address the, the chronic underfunding. We don't see anything in the fiscal policy that says we're actually going to we're actually going to uh, significantly increase what First Nations are owed. Uh, and then things are a little bit sunnier, shall I say, for uh, modern treaty holders. I think that depending on your situation, the rights framework is going to affect you differently. If you're an uh, Indian Act fan with a historic treaty, you're going to be very affected by this. If you're a self-governing First Nation uh, in a modern treaty, it's going to affect you less. But part of the rights framework legislation is going back and figuring out how to fix the modern treaties because, you know, we've created some uh, over the, over the course of 40 years, there's something like 18 uh, modern treaties, I think, 20 modern treaties, uh, which covers all the areas of land where no treaty was ever made, of course. And those First Nations in one Inuit group, well, actually a couple of Inuit groups, groups where are expected to surrender an extinguished title on 90% of their territory. They get to keep 10%, 1% subsurface. Then they get all the, you know, $300 million, and they get self-government. I mean, I think critics have rightly pointed out how this is a very limited form of self-government. Uh, most of these modern treaty holders will say they're better off than Indian Act bans, which may be true, but uh, nonetheless, it's not a real restoration of, of First Nation jurisdiction or power. But what the federal government is doing is saying, we're going to fix the implementation problems because <laughs> every single one of these modern treaty holders, except for one, has had to form an organization called the Land Claims Coalition of Canada just to lobby the federal government to implement the treaties, the modern treaties. So what's hap what happened to historic treaties is basically now happening to modern treaties. Uh, but they are, the federal government is saying, we're gonna look at debt forgiveness. So all the debt that you accumulated over 20 years of negotiating this treaty, that $50 million you, of debt you accumulated, $48 million of debt you accumulated, we're gonna think about forgiving that. Um, um, so there are some positive elements, but uh, it's a different fiscal fiscal relationship on the modern treaty side than with, with uh, Indian Act bans. So um, they have a new financing regime that has gone to cabinet. And now they're sort of working out the details. It's still unclear what's going to happen to OSR, own source revenue. Right now, Canada has a moratorium. They're not going to claw back anything First Nations make in the own source revenue. Um, so we'll see how long that, that uh, moratorium lasts. Also in policy are the rights recognition tables. So I mentioned this earlier. Um, so I think Canada has come to realize really ever since the EFERT report uh, in 2010, I think it was 2010. Uh, no, it must have been later than that. I think it was 2015. Anyone know when the EFERT report came out? 
2014, thank you, Russ. Uh, Canada realized what First Nations <laughs> have been saying for a long time was that these self-government, uh, modern treaty processes are taking 20 years. There's, there's Inuit, Inuit Quebec who have been negotiating 35 years. 35 years they've been negotiating for a, a modern treaty. In that time, how much, is, how much are your legal fees, your consultant fees? And then what do you get at the end of the day? So there's a lot of criticism of the modern treaties. The federal government's recognizing that. And now they're moving to this sectoral treaty approach. So all the areas where title is still recognized, we all know that we have title everywhere. But the federal government doesn't recognize that. They believe that in historic treaty areas, we surrendered our title, extinguished our title. So they only recognize treat title where no treaty has been made. So we're talking about British Columbia primarily, but a few other places. And in those areas, they are saying, let's move away from the big modern treaty that we've been creating that doesn't seem to work and move towards sectoral agreements. So we'll create a, a temporary agreement with you on fisheries or we'll create a temporary agreement with you on forestry. We'll give you some money over five years to get access to your land to exploit those resources, basically. Uh, but we won't extinguish your title anymore, so they say. They've moved from, of course, extinguishment to modification to certainty to non-assertion. They've used, they've tried to come up with four or five different concepts or, 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 or uh, euphemisms for extinguishment, so, but they're still pushing it. So we'll see what they say now. In the rights framework recognition stuff, they're, they're talking about the coexistence of title. So sort of um, moving slowly, slowly down the discursive line. Um, so, the, so I think I'll, some First Nations would uh, like this. They would say, yeah, we're gonna keep our title. We're not interested in this large modern treaty to uh, surrender our all 90% of our territory, 99% of our subsurface territory, but we'll talk to you on this one issue and hold on to our title. But it pushes the discussion of First Nation jurisdiction down the line. The, co the government with this new process is not recognized Aboriginal title. They're not recognizing Aboriginal title. They're not recognizing Indigenous jurisdiction. This is just a new way to manage it. Um, but nonetheless, there's 70 of these, these tables and First Nations are participating. I should say there's, I think there's, uh, let me try to think of the, uh, so there's 70 tables, 350 communities, half of the community, uh, half of the population that is represented in these uh, tables are Métis organizations. So again, it's interesting that Métis organizations are pushing a lot of this discussion. So finally, and I don't know what time it is. Uh, 11.38. Okay. Uh, so finally, well not quite finally, but uh, the third part of our analysis was legislative reform. So um, in addition to the changing the structure of government, in, in addition to, the, to uh, new policies that are emerging, we're renovating policies really because there's, I think, there's, I think you know, my collaborator Sherry Pasternak thinks that they're just taking all the old policies, renaming them, and then putting them out again. But they're also, they're also, um, changing the legislation. So we have uh, Bill C-68 and Bill C-69, so we have impact assessment legislation, we have Fisheries Act legislation, we have the Canadian National uh, Energy Regulator, I think it's called the Regulator Act. Um, we have uh, the Senate Bill S-3, which is gonna change status, Indian status, and uh, open it up to, uh, I think about 600,000 new people. We're gonna have legislation that's gonna <coughs> confirm the split of the Department of Indian Affairs and Early Development. Uh, we have the uh, Romeo Saganash's um, uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous uh, Peoples Implementation Act. So we do actually have a tremendous amount of legislation coming out of this government. As I said before, each of these pieces of legislation is going through the quote unquote decolonization process where a decolonization committee of uh, liberal cabinet members um, protected by cabinet secrecy says this is what we think Aboriginal rights are and this piece of legislation uh, um, passes our test or it doesn't pass our test. So, they, so each of these pieces of legislation, well these, the omnibus legislation for fisheries and impact assessment went through this, uh, went through this process. We do know who sits on that committee but we don't know much else about that. Um, 
So, uh, just sort, sort of quickly about the scope of the legislation. Uh, I can't, you can't really see this chart here, but each of... So, I think it's important to emphasize that this is an incredibly active government when it comes to legislation. So, since Confederation, there have been 41 pieces of legislation introduced and passed uh, affecting Indigenous people, specifically. For legislation specifically affecting Indigenous people. Uh, in this government's tenure, 15, 16 pieces of legislation have been passed or are introduced, affecting specifically affecting First Nations. That means that 41% of all legislation affecting Indigenous people will have been passed if they all passed by this government. That's tremendous. Uh, now, some of the pieces of legislation are pretty benign. You know, they're we want to recognize warm shirts or national recognition, uh, national. Uh, Reconciliation Day or something like that. But they do include, as I said, environmental assessment, uh, uh, the changes to the National Energy Board, the Fisheries Act, uh, splitting INAC, splitting INAC, uh, languages legislation, uh, rights recognition legislation, which is coming in December. So all this legislation is gonna have a significant impact. And it also gives us a sneak peek at what the, how the federal government is conceiving um, indigenous rights. So for instance, the impact, uh, the analysis of the Fisheries Act is actually um, saying it's not, a, it's not a bad piece of legislation for First Nations, actually. Uh, it's pretty decent. It includes participation, it includes the incorporation of indigenous knowledge. It does not recognize indigenous jurisdiction or title, of course, or consent. Uh, but the impact assessment legislation is a little bit more constrained. So that is the one area where you would expect to see free prior informed consent incorporated into the legislation because of course it's through the environmental assessment process or impact assessment process where the duty to consult is triggered. So a project, a significant project, not a small scale project, but a significant project goes through the environmental assessment process. They figure out whose treaty ter territories there are or who's asserting uh, treaty rights there. Then they go and consult with them and they say, hey, this project's gonna happen. If it's a small project, they might write you a letter. If it's a big project, they might invite you in for a meeting. Um, so it's in this legislation that we would expect to see some mention of free prior and informed consent. And in fact, the expert panels, sometimes Canada pulls together an expert panel to study an issue and make recommendations. The expert panel on environmental assessment said, include consent in the legislation. The federal government did. So we get a sense of what the rights recognition framework is going to include and what it's not going to include, and it's not going to include consent. Um, so the legislation specifically on the rights recognition, we got our first glimpse of what's probably going to be in that legislation in September when they released their proposal. Uh, the proposal was, I think, roundly criticized by First Nations across the country, at least those that were at the AFN National Assembly in September. Uh, it effect effectively has four components, so we sort of know what to expect now, although the federal government, will see what happens, but uh, it's going to emphasize a way out of the Indian Act. So the federal government is going to say, finally, we have this process to get out of the Indian Act. Now, of course, we've got to contextualize this. It's been attempted in the past with the 1969 White Paper, the uh, Governance Act in the mid-2000s, um, uh, Charlottetown Accord, Accord, of course. Uh, now we have the Trudeau government's attempt to do so with the Rights Recognition Framework Implementation Act. So it's going to be an opt-in opt process, opt-out of the Indian Act, opt-into the Rights Recognition process. And if you can aggregate your, fir if you can aggregate your First Nations, uh, get your financing regime in place, figure out how you're going to deliver services, Canada will recognize you as a self-governing First Nation. So it's interesting and sort of ironic, you know, because you have Carolyn Bennett saying, we're going to get, away, get out of the way of First Nations who want to be self-governing. And then here they are, they're going to create this legislation that puts the federal government right in the middle, right in the path. It says, if you want to be self-governing, we got to recognize you first. And then you can go on the other way and take on our the devolution of services. So it's, it's really federal recognition legislation. The, the government is giving itself the powers in law 
to recognize who's self-governing and who's not. And you go back to that impact assessment legislation or fisheries legislation or regulatory act legislation, and it uses strange words like indigenous governing body. You know, not Indian, not Indian band, not First Nation. So though, even that legislation has been drafted to an eye towards the rights framework legislation. Um, and then there's an open-ended negotiation process. So right now the federal government is, is experimenting with this uh, mandateless negotiation process. Is anybody sitting at one of these recognition rights framework tables? Recognition self-determination tables? Well, apparently the negotiators from the federal government are given a, they're given a non-mandate from cabinet to say, everything's on the table, we'll sort it out. If we come to an agreement, then we'll go back to the cabinet and get permission and then sort it out, as opposed to having a very narrow negotiating mandate. So um, they want to have this open-ended negotiation process. They're willing to discuss a number of issues under self-government. Of course, we know that none of those issues can infringe on provincial powers, because the rights recognition framework is fundamentally, above all, a protection of provincial powers framework. Nothing fundamentally is going to change about confederation. From the 10 principles down to this recognition framework. Um, now, uh, to the first, to the federal government's credit, I'm not sure if I want to give them credit for this, but they, <laughs> they do, they are willing to create a, a recognition advisory body. So, if they need advice or guidance on whether or not to recognize a first nation or a reconstituted nation as self-governing, then they're going to create, they're going to create one of two options: a permanent body that will give advice to the federal government. Yes, they should qualify for self-government, or no, they shouldn't. Or an ad hoc, case-by-case -case body that will do the, effectively the same thing. So the legislation, I'm not so sure. I think Russ maybe uh, might elaborate what he thinks is going to be in the legislation in his presentation. But I'm, I, I'm, I have a very hard time believing that the federal government is going to say, this is what Section 35 rights are, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. They may. But um, they, I think they'll say that self-government is their Section 35 right. Here's what self-government is. And then uh, we'll be in a little bit of a pickle after that because the space is going to be service delivery. Mm. Um, so this is a little bit of a chart. You can't really see it. The uh, resolution on this PowerPoint uh, presentation is not uh, effective but, um, or high. So the rights recognition framework sort of looks like this, if you can follow along. And again, this is primarily for historic treaty and Indian Act First Nation bans. It doesn't really apply to modern treaty holders. And in fact, there are elements of the modern treaty relationship, self-governing relationship over there. But basically, the federal government is envisioning, envisioning a transitionary process. So this is happening right now. You know it's all happening. It's, it, every time you get money for a membership code, or an election code, or a financial regulations code, that's what this is about. Uh, you're writing those codes in preparation to become self-government, right? Canada wants you to build capacity. So uh, reconstitute nations, start thinking about regional service delivery, Nishnabek Nation, Nishnabek Child Welfare System, Manitoba First Nation Child Welfare System, BC Housing Authority, BC, BC Health Authority. Uh, create comprehensive community plans, you know, get, get yourself in order, figure out what your community wants, how you want to get it, who has responsibility, how much it's going to cost. Uh, build your financial capacity. You do all of those things in this transitionary process, then the legislation will drop, and then you can apply to be a reconstituted or self-governing governing nation, and you can have re reserve-based self-government. Reserve-based. Um, you can uh, take on service delivery in an aggregated form, remember. I think larger First Nations will be qualified to deliver their own services. Six Nations will be fine. Um, but other communities, smaller communities will have to uh, uh, combine their, their, their resources. Um, uh, I can't read my uh, text here. <laughs> Limited federal financial obligations. Yes. So over time, the federal government, I think, in the short term, the federal government is saying we're not going to, you know, we're not going to take your OSR. We're not going to reduce funding. In fact, we're going to increase funding. Um, but I suspect if modern treaty self-government is a model, they will, ex they will expect over time First Nations to start upping their service fees, taxes in other words, and they will start asking First Nations to look at uh, uh, different land tenure systems. Um, uh, re restricted access to traditional territories. So this is underlying everything in the rights framework is land. 
there is no discussion of land in the rights framework process. And in fact, it goes so far as to protect the province's powers, as I said. Constitutionally, it's the provinces that have uh, powers over lands, resources in their jurisdiction. So if you're not going to bring provinces into this discussion, then you're not going to redistribute land. And if you're not going to redistribute land, then you cannot seriously accept, expect us to believe we're going to have a conversation about Indigenous rights. They don't include land rights. So this is all reserve based, no access to traditional territory. There is uh, a potential for treaty holders to have jurisdiction outside of the reserves, and I'll talk about that briefly. So the result is these reconstituted nations, aggregated First Nations, service delivery, um, quote unquote self-government, but it's reserve based and it's basically you know, what we have today, except a little bit uh, uh, tighter. So what are the goals? The goals of the rights framework are, are also our concerns at Yellowhead. So it sort of, it maintains the status quo. If you look at the 1995 inherent right self-government policy, it'll tell you here are the things that we can negotiate for self-government. Here are the things we may be able to negotiate for self-government, and here are the things that are off the table for self-government. And I think that um, you know the inherent right policy very clearly says self-government exists within Canadian constitutional framework, not outside of it. Provinces are protected, um, so it's very much in line with the existing inherent right policy though it does include more flexible mechanisms uh, of self-government, so sectoral agreements or incremental self-government agreements. Um, so it entrenches land and self-government policies that do not address First Nations jurisdiction, traditional authorities, inherent rights, uh, uh, natural rights, um, or the broader territories of our communities. Um, it does say get out of the Indian Act, but what it says to get into is this uh, new form of uh, delegated authority, devolution, aggregated service delivery populations. Uh, it domesticates the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. You know, it is very frustrating to, to hear Canadians think that Canada has accepted the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and implementing it, and that's the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, Canada is trying to figure out how they could make the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People fit within its constitutional framework uh, within Section 35, and um, and there does not seem to be, at least in my opinion, any genuine effort to implement uh, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, at least its spirit understood by the people that negotiated it. Um, Build financial capacity with First Nations to transition away from the Indian Act and towards, and I don't know if they're going to be called self-government agreements. I really don't think that it will be, you know, uh, self-government agreements, but it will be something like that. Like, um, and of course, above all, protecting the rights of uh, provinces and the, and the federal government. No, we have self-determination agreements. Self-determination agreements. No doubt they will. <laughs> So what about consent? Where does consent fit into this? Well, there's two aspects. If you are an Indian Act band that is on a reserve under the Indian Act right now with a historic treaty, you can expect reserve-based consent. So in one of the pieces of legislation in the Omnibus Acts that the federal government is running through Parliament now, there uh, is called the National um, Energy Regulator Act. I think that's what it's called. And it says you can't build a pipeline across a First Nation without their consent. So first time in Canadian legislation where First Nation First Nations are afforded any consent whatsoever, at least in that language. In policy, this already exists. The federal government is not going to allow, or the provinces are not going to allow any development to happen on a First Nation reserve without their permission. That's just not going to happen. Now, the Indian Act has allowed for that, right? They have allowed, historically, for provinces to expropriate land, municipalities to expropriate land, um, and really flexible leasing agreements for individuals to surrender land to, uh, uh, to, to undertake that. But um, in policy, that's not going to happen. So ca Canada has basically recognized that, and they've included this in the National Energy Regulator Act. So consent on reserve development. So it will not be a surprise if in these other pieces of legislation, not the Impact Assessment Act, but in the rights framework that potentially uh, consent may appear, but it will be reserve-based. It will stop at the edge of the reserve. 
And then if you have title, you uh, may, depending on how negotiations go and what the rights framework looks, at the, it looks like at the end of the day, get your title recognized and then enter into either a co-management regime or a power sharing regime. And you can probably sit at a table, maybe three First Nation representatives, maybe a provincial representative and a federal representative or two provincial representatives, and you can share decision-making power over that land. Um, but there will be no recognition of First Nation power. There will be no consent on uh, title lands, at least title lands that the federal government recognizes. Let's keep in mind that the federal government has not yet to date ever recognized the First Nation interpretation of historic treaties. So they continue and courts continue to uphold the very narrow, very conservative written word on treaties continue to privilege that, and that is what continues to dispossess us of our land if we're in historic treaty areas. So uh, that's what the rights framework is about. The federal government, whether it's Minister Philpott, Minister Bennett, uh, Justin Trudeau, Jody Wilson-Raybould will tell you wonderful things about this process and about this legislation and about the general changes that are happening. And I think for a lot of our communities, we have been sitting down for too much of this discussion and not paying attention, close attention to what's happening. Because that is not the case. The, the, what's happening is uh, a threat to our inherent rights and our treaty rights through this process. Is it gonna be worse than what we currently have right now under the Indian Act? Maybe not. Are there some positive elements of the rights framework that will help us build capacity and deliver services better? Probably. But is it actually gonna recognize our rights, our title, our jurisdiction? No, and in fact, it's going to truncate it. So if you have any leaders, if you have any political leaders or First Nation leaders or national chiefs or anybody that, tell it, that tells you that this is a great thing for First Nations or that it's not written yet and be patient, hold on, let's see about it, they're misleading. That's my opinion and the opinion of my colleagues at the Yellowhead Institute. Anyway. So I don't know if I have time for questions. Uh, do I have time for questions? Two minutes. Sure. Okay, two minutes for questions. I don't know if anybody has a question. Um, yeah. Okay, I, my name is Billy Wadsworth. I'm from the Blood Tribe, Blackfoot Confederacy. Uh, I was a councilman in the past term and not a uh, councilman anymore. Um, in 2016, I think it was, uh, well, let me just fast forward. I, I won't get to all that other stuff. I had a bunch of questions. But, so, what are your thoughts on the MOU, the modern MOUs that are being written right now? We had an MOU written. Uh, by our uh, 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 an agreement with our nation and, and the feds, and there was no there was no terms of that MOU that was presented to us by our leadership, and I'm just wondering what what do, what do you think? What are your thoughts on those MOUs? I think that for First Nations that have had such difficulty getting any federal officials to sit down with them at the table on a regular basis, the MOUs are a good thing because the MOUs don't really spell anything out. All they say is we're gonna to commit to meet with you every three months. We're gonna to commit to meet with you every two, twice a year or something like that. And these are our shared concerns. We're gonna work on figuring that out. So if the MOUs actually are, if they actually send people regularly to meet and have any robust, significant conversation, then I think the MOUs are probably a good thing. Like it's a good thing to have that open negotiation and sit down and talk. I do think that the what's on the table for negotiation is gonna be constrained. So I think the federal government is coming to the table more than, uh, of course, the conservative government did over 10 years to have conversations. But I don't think that the scope of the discussions is going to be much more substantive than they have been in the past. Um, and I'm also concerned that this federal government is basically processing us to death. Another process on top of another process on top of another process. You know, If they were serious about uh, this discussion, then the blood tribe would come to the table and say, this is what we want, and the federal government would sit down and say, okay, here you go. I don't think that's going to happen, but, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, unless there's anything else, thank you for your attention and, and coming, and uh, good luck with the rest of the conference. and. You can learn more about the Yellowhead Institute here, and we have our 30-page report on analyzing the rights framework at yellowheadinstitute.org. Um, 
Dean Witch.